South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says Kofi Annan's death is a great shock and loss to the global community. He paid tribute to the Nobel laureate shortly before his departure from Windhoek, Namibia, where he attended the 38th Ordinary Summit of the Southern African Development Community. Meanwhile, incoming SADC chair Namibian President Hage Gaingob was visibly shocked on hearing the news. The President, uh, Dr. Hage Gaingob, is, uh, is a friend of Kofi Annan and uh, he is uh, settled by the passing of the former Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, the two leaders have shared uh, several platforms, they know each other very well, and uh, the President expresses uh, sadness with the passing of uh, a man he defined and described as a global statesman, a hero of the African continent, and someone who has served passionately humanity at large. And let's go to the United Nations headquarters now in New York. Of course, this is where the former Secretary General served from 1997 to 2006. CGTN's John Terrett is standing by. John, one can only imagine that it must be something of a somber mood in the corridors of the United Nations today. Well, Lindy, it's ironic because it's a Saturday, but what's even more ironic is that tomorrow, Sunday the 19th, is the UN's International Humanitarian Day, and if Kofi Annan is known for anything, it is his humanitarian efforts during his long career at the United Nations. And it's a pity it's a Saturday because they don't have the flags outside the building on a Saturday, and I think if it was a weekday, they would be flying now at half-mast. I mean, Kofi Annan was a hugely popular Secretary General. He served here between 1997 and 2007. Of course, he was the first black African to hold that post. He had a long career in human rights and also peacekeeping. He was the head of the peacekeeping division for a while. And he once said, Lindy, you can take the man out of the UN, but you can't take the UN out of the man. And I think that sums up Kofi Annan's attitude to his job and his work and the building and the staff here in New York and around the world better mm. than almost anything. Lindy? Absolutely. And John, just take us through some of the official reaction that's come uh, from the UN headquarters. It's coming in now from all over the world, but uh, prime among them is the Secretary General of today, Antonio Guterres, who called Kofi Annan a guiding force for good, said he was a proud son of Africa and a champion for peace and humanity. Nana Akufo Addo, the president of Ghana, where Kofi Annan was born, as you know, he was educated in America, but he was born in Ghana, said that he was a consummate international diplomat, uh, engendered great pride in the country, and uh, the the next week in Ghana is going to be a week of national mourning. Uh, Tony Blair, who's the British Prime Minister, whose term in office at number 10 Downing Street coincided almost exactly with Kofi Annan's time at the United Nations headquarters, said that he was a great diplomat, a great statesman and a wonderful colleague. And Tony Blair expressed great surprise because he'd seen Kofi Annan only a couple of weeks ago and he seemed well. Mm, indeed. Uh, and John, of course, as we reflect on how Kofi Annan helped uh, to really shape the United Nations, perhaps you can just uh, re reflect from your own personal experience what comes to mind for you as a reporter that covered world politics uh, from the UN perspective. You know, he was very accessible. When he was here, you could talk to him. You'd see him in the corridor, you'd see him in the canteen occasionally, and if you wanted the answer to a question, he would make sure that you got it one way or another. So very, very accessible to the staff and also to the journalists who cover the beat. I think it's memorable that he won the Nobel Peace Prize, which you can still see in the UN basement. It's on display today. He won that in 2001, along with the UN itself, for essentially revitalizing the organization and shifting it towards his passion, which is humanitarian work. In the shadows, though, unfortunately, oh, the other thing that he, I know, was very proud of was the Millennium Goals, by the way. I should point that out. There are eight Millennium Goals, which were commissioned at the time of the turn of the century, and he was very, very proud of those. They are eight goals with very specific targets and the idea is that you try and make the world a better place particularly for poor people but in the shadows there are issues Rwanda is top among them he was apparently tipped off that the genocide in 1994 might happen and some accused him of not doing enough on Srebrenica the massacre one year later in 1995 Kofi Annan as the Secretary General then apologized to the world community that the world community itself particularly the UN didn't do enough to help in Bosnia particularly 
in the Srebrenica massacre. There was the invasion of Iraq, which he called illegal. He wanted it to be a part of the UN Security Council, but it wasn't. In the end, it was America and a coalition of the willing, and that was an indication that the UN wasn't perhaps as powerful or as influential in the world as people had previously thought. And then there's the oil for food scandal in which he and his brother were implicated. Mm -hmm. Kofi Annan was later cleared of all charges against him, but it's something that hung over his otherwise excellent time here at UN headquarters. Lindy? Well, thank you so much, John. Really appreciate uh, that look back at the life and the legacy of the former UN Secretary General. Now, four decades of Kofi Annan's career were spent at the United Nations. CGTN's James Chow had an opportunity to sit with the statesman in an exclusive interview in which he looked back at his career and the legacy he'd leave behind. Let's take a look. When we think of Copenhagen, Cancun, Doha and Durban, many people have come away very disappointed. What's going to be the game changer for Paris so that the world backs off from this tipping point that you're warning of? Certain governments, important governments, have come up with indications that they are going to uh, work for an agreement or they are going to do a lot in their own countries. China has come up, the United States has come up, India uh, has, and I think the, these could be game changers. And in, in fact, we've always maintained that the big powers, particularly the developed countries, should take the lead. Talk more about game changers. You've always believed in the power and action of young people. You've always been disappointed by what you say has been their exclusion from discussion and decision making. But you're changing all that now. You're helping lead Call on COP, a movement created by One Young World. Mr. Anand, what do you want young people to call for today? I think the young people should make climate change their issue. They should insist on it. They should discuss it and help push it higher up the political agenda and keep it there. Once it's up the political agenda, the politicians cannot ignore it. But they themselves have power, they have influence as individuals. They have power as voters, they have power as uh, shoppers. The choices they make when they go into a supermarket, which products they are buying, which companies they are supporting, and really use that pressure also to make a difference. I want to finish with this because when we think of Paris, everyone is watching this city for the horrific terror attacks that occurred there in November. Mr. Anand, you're a world leader. Will your peers at COP21 be reminded of the fragility of life and act on that for climate change in a way they've never done before? They, they have an opportunity. They have an opportunity and they should seize the moment and show leadership and tell young and future generations that this is a group of leaders who did not miss the opportunity to help halt the, uh, the damage that climate change is doing to our planet. And that they t exercise leadership, they stuck their necks out, and they took the right decisions. And that we will walk away from Paris with an agreement that is fair, equitable, and hopefully binding. Kofi Annan, it's a great honor speaking with you. Good to see you. And thanks for the work you do on AIDS. Well, as we reflect on the life of Kofi Annan, I'm joined in studio now by the former head of Kenya's mission to France, Ambassador Boaz Mbaya. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you. There's been a lot of praise, of course, heaped on Kofi Annan today. Um, but we know, of course, that he presided over the UN during a very difficult time in world history with conflicts all over the world. When you look at some of the, the, the most difficult times during his tenure, what stands out for you? I first of all, I want to say that he was a very, uh, very accomplished diplomat. Mm -hmm. Accomplished in the sense that he grew up through the UN system, so he understood the issues that were before the UN Security Council, as well as the issues that were affecting the continents variously in many parts of the, uh, the world. What stands out for me was his passion for trying to search for peace and uh, resolve the many conflicts, particularly in Africa, that uh, afflicted this continent for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And as a son of Africa, he took particular interest to ensure that uh, those conflicts received attention, international attention for 
a possible solution. Mm. Yeah. And both within the UN and outside of it, his passion for Africa came across very strongly. And he never really minced his words when it came to addressing some of the you know, leadership failures that we saw on the continent. Uh, Kofi Annan believed in the welfare of societies, welfare of people. He did not believe in strong uh, armed tactics or strong uh, leaders and so forth, mm -hmm. as long as they understood that the, the import of their being in power was for the service of the people, mm -hmm. he was happy with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes him also stand out as a, a person of concern, good, uh, good uh, philanthropist, if you want to call it that way, and indeed uh, a statesman that was keen to see that the world remained peaceful. Indeed. Yeah. And as a, uh, as a diplomat yourself, what would you say are the key qualities that you admired in him that you perhaps implemented in your own work? Patience, that's one. He was a patient man. He was uh, uh, particular about details, and I think he studied the issues before he even attempted to find a solution to them. So mm -hmm. I would like to believe that uh, any diplomat would want to emulate uh, Kofi Annan's uh, attitude to work and his humility as well as his... Uh, great attention to detail. Mm. Yes. And, and I just want to read something that he actually said a year ago in an interview. He said, um, acknowledging that the UN is not perfect, he said the UN can be improved. It is not perfect, but if it didn't exist, you would have to create it. Do you think that he left the UN in better shape than he found it? I think he served most of his uh, civil service life, public service life in the UN and he did a lot. He may be accused of one or two neglects, but uh, overall, the United Nations works at the whims of uh, sta member states. Uh, he was therefore a servant of uh, member states of the United Nations, so he had to, to beat their, their will, really, to, mm -hmm. so to speak. But I think he craftily managed to advise and also provide leadership in terms of seeking direction on so many of mm -hmm. those issues. And of course, there's been many tributes coming out in his honor. One that stood out for me was the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Azid Rad Al Hussein, saying, Kofi was humanity's best example, the epitome of human decency and grace. In a world now filled with leaders who are anything but that, our loss, the world's loss, becomes even more painful. He certainly set a very high standard of leadership. He did. He set a very high standard. That's why the world continued to seek his advice and his involvement in a lot of those uh, uh, the, the restrictions. Syria, for instance, he was appointed a special envoy there, and he did a good job until he realized that the situation was much bigger than uh, the, the, the world had believed. And I think he gave uh, an indication as to how it could be resolved except with the willing parties. Mm. And this has not happened yet. Mm. Yes. Indeed. Well, yes. thank you so much, Ambassador Boas, uh, just giving us some perspective on the life and times of Kofi Annan.